Wonderful. Uh, welcome to the Sustainability in Wine Country online series hosted by Cork and Fork in Logan Circle, Washington, DC. My name is Antoinette Londijan, and it is a pleasure to be with you today. This is the fourth masterclass in the series focusing on sustainability in viticulture. We will start this series with a brief introduction, followed by our guest speaker's presentation, and end with a short Q&A. The first masterclass of this series addressed the efforts made by New Zealand wine growers and their sustainability movement. We then heard from the Lodi Rules team and Dr. Stephanie Bolton. Staying with the Californian focus, after Lodi Rules, we heard from the Fish Friendly Farming Certification Program of the California Land Steward Stewardship Institute, hosted by Laurel Marcus. Today, we are honored to host our guest speaker, Dr. Marty Longbottom. Marty is the Sustainability and Viticulture Manager at the Australian Wine Research Institute. Madi began her career in the wine industry in the early 1990s, helping to establish her family's vineyard in South Australia. Shortly afterwards, she gained her viticultural degree and held technical and vineyard management positions spanning numerous Australian wine regions. After completing her postgraduate qualifications and several years working as a lecturer in viticulture at the University of Adelaide, she traveled to the United States where she worked as a viticulture extension specialist at Virginia Tech. For the past 13 years, Madi has focused on research and extension of wine industry sustainability projects, including regional climate risk analysis, benchmarking greenhouse gas emissions from vineyards, the management of corporate water assets, and she manages the Australian wine industry's sustainability program Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. We are excited to introduce you to Marty and delighted to now begin the presentation. Thank you to all for viewing, thank you to all for viewing and for being a part of the Sustainability in Wine Country series. We really hope you enjoy it. Marty, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Antoinette, and lovely to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm first going to just, um, I'm joining you today from Ghana country and in the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Uh, in starting my presentation on sustainability, I will focus on the Sustainable Wine Growing Australia program, but I thought probably the best place for us to start the conversation is really talking about what is sustainability and what does sustainability mean? I think um, globally we've come to understand what it is. I mean, some people, ref people refer to it in different ways, but I think if um, we use this commonly used diagram here that shows the intersection of um, money or financial elements, the environment and the community, and that it's at this intersect of those three elements is where we say sustainability is occurring. Some people call it the three Ps, so people, planet and profits. I think the important thing with this is, though, that uh, it's important to acknowledge that these three things aren't always equal. And quite often, I think historically, we've really focused on the environmental element, but it's always been acknowledged how important the financial and the community elements are to sustainability. Some years we see things move like this and our profits or our financial position is more important than the other elements of sustainability. And in other times, the financial part is less important. So I think it's important, again, just to acknowledge that there's these three really critical uh, elements and they do change from time to time. I guess what I like to think about in sustainability and in the context of viticulture is I think about it a bit like this diagram here. Each of the circles in my picture here represents a year or a vintage. And I see ourselves every year we go through this bit of a cycle as we go through the growing season ending with vintage. So this first one here you can see is vintage 20, we're going to vintage 21 coming up and vintage 22. Now, as a grower in the growing season, we've got this interaction with our environment. So there are many, many things that we interact with. So we have an influence over our natural resources, but the natural elements and the environment also influences the way we perform in our vineyard businesses. So that's what I'm representing here, the environmental element. And then we can see that we also, as an industry, we have an interaction with our community. And that, again, that goes both ways. 
And there's also this influence of the finances. So as businesses, we're generating revenue, but we're also spending money in our communities. And I guess the picture I'm starting to build here is that it is a very complex system that we're working in. But I guess just to provide you a bit more context around what this really means for us in the wine industry and specifically to viticulture. And as we go through each of these seasons, we continue to have these influences. They may change in the level of influence they have on our business. For example, they're in Vintage 21. I'm just showing that that vintage was much bigger than Vintage 22. So potentially the revenue coming into our business is higher. Um, we may have spent more on water and energy and fertilisers. Um, and we're having a very positive impact on the communities that we're operating in. So as we go through each of these seasons, we've got these interacting influences, a quite a complex system, but ultimately to be sustainable, we're talking about businesses having resilience and have, being able to sustain that resilience in our businesses from generation to generation through those um, years. So that's how I think about sustainability. I think at the grassroots level, growers and winemakers in Australia understand what sustainability means. This is Mandy Jones in the photograph here, and she's with her brother, Arthur, that they have a, a generational family grape and wine business in the Rutherglen region in Victoria in Australia. And what she says is that they try to instill sustainable practices across all parts of their business because they know that they've got this responsibility for future generations. And that's what we commonly hear when we're out on the road talking to growers and winemakers. If we think about the customer landscape, this is just a bit of a snapshot. We, we have a bit of a watching brief on our international marketplace and some of our key retailers and the gatekeepers. And if you just had a look at some of their websites, you can see that there's this has been going on for quite a long time, but you can see that they've all got different ways of um, looking at their products that they put on their shelves and assessing the credentials of them before they actually supply them to the uh, consumers. So if you have a quick look here, they're, they're saying different things about how they're going to assess um, how a supplier is managing their footprint. They've got system-wide carbon measurement and tracking systems. They have different codes of conducts. Some of them do supplier audits, etc. right across the globe. I think the important thing though that's emerging is that more and more of these businesses are aligning with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And if you're not yet familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, this is a snapshot of what they are. The United Nations have come together and they've essentially put together a bit of a blueprint um, to enable people to, I guess, better um, manage their sustainability. And for us, what it does, it enables us to align with a set of criteria that we can start to benchmark ourselves against. From the perspective of the consumers, as consumers, many of you will also, you know, intrinsically understand and when you're thinking about wine, there are many influences that, um, I guess, go into choosing a bottle of wine. But we know that there's growing expectation that everything that people consume, whether it be the fruit and vegetables in the supermarket or wine, that there's increasing expectation that the pro produce that we purchase is being produced in a sustainable way. So as growers, we know that we need to be able to demonstrate that and really clearly and confidently communicate our sustainability credentials. So I guess switching to Sustainable Wine Growing Australia, the program itself. The program itself um, has been evolving over many years. As an industry, the Australian wine industry started talking about sustainability in a formal way, probably in the early 1990s. And I certainly remember it when I first started working in the Australian wine industry and some of those foundational resources that we put down back then, we still refer to and we still use today. In terms of a formal framework for measuring and reporting sustainability, we've been doing that since around about 2009. Um, and then more recently, we've gone through another evolution where we've called ourselves Sustainable Wine Growing Australia. And then last year, we launched a trust mark so that people can use to communicate their sustainability credentials. So you can see the trust mark there on my screen right now. Um, the program itself is open to vineyards and wineries. It's a completely voluntary program. 
and I'll give you some insights into, I guess, some of the highlights from our program. And um, I think the important thing I wanted to show you, this is Dave Wynn Stanley. He's from Margaret River and he's, he's the vineyard manager for Lewin Estate over there. He's been one of the um, long-standing members of the program and they've also been certified for a long time. They joined the program in 2011. So this is really just to demonstrate that there's been a lot of people on this journey and really um, being aware of their sustainability credentials for quite some time. In terms of our membership of the program, we now have members across 48 of our 65 regions in Australia. And if you know anything about where wine is, or grapes are grown in Australia, they're predominantly in the southern parts of Australia. But you can see on the map there, we have a number of members over in the west of, of Australia, and then uh, quite a large cluster in the southeast of, of Australia. So that's covering 48 regions. Um, in terms of the membership, we're getting really close to having around 800 members now and about 15% of those are certified. Now, in terms of the vineyard area that we cover, it's around about a quarter of the wine grape vineyard area in Australia and around about a quarter of the national crush of wine grapes. Now, the way the program works is, so again, we've, we've gone through this massive evolution of the program, but essentially all members, they go into an online system every year and they report a standard set of business metrics or data. So that data includes their production and resource use data, including water, energy, waste, biodiversity, and soil management. And then they go through a workbook, which is a self-assessment of their practices. So that includes some additional elements, including biosecurity, air management, pest and disease management, business, and community. Now, vineyards and wineries do this separately because their data is quite different. Then we have the, I guess, the separate element of the program is the certification program. I'll give you some details on that a little bit later. But those who are, um, have the bigger commitment to the program go on to become third party certified. And the really important part about the certification is, as I've said before, this is where the members of the program can really communicate with some confidence about their credentials. And this is what's really important in the community. So I'll just show you this very quickly. Members go into an online platform, they work through a number of different elements of the program and they record all of their data online so that we then at the end of the year can access all of the data. Um, the thing that is quite unique about the Australian program, Sustainable Wine Growing Australia, is that all members, it, this is not just giving data for the sake of getting, giving data, it's actually a really useful tool. And the members, once they've submitted all of their data and done their own self-assessments, they receive back a number of different reports. And you can see the list of those reports there. So um, really importantly, they get a summary of all their data, but they can also see how they're comparing to others in their region and nationally and I'll show you some of the other things so they can get a historical account of all of the data that they put in. So over a number of years, they can track what their yield is, how much water they've used, their nitrogen, electricity, energy, other things. So all of the data is presented like this. So they've got a um, comprehensive historical account of how they've performed. Um, the data that they supply feeds into a scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions summary. So this is an example one here on the left, you can see a breakdown of the emissions by year. So for a vineyard, scope one and scope two emissions include the emissions from electricity, from fertilizer, and also from fuel use. And what you can see there is that those emissions are then broken down proportionally. So that, that is um, provided to all the members every year. One of the most, um, I guess, valuable parts of the program, what members tell us constantly, is that probably the best part about it, though, is not only do they get to see their data, but they get to look over the fence at their neighbours and have a look at how they're performing compared to them, so that real ability to benchmark themselves. So this is the same kind of set of data, but presented in a different way. A member can go in and choose to compare themselves and rank themselves against others in their region or state or a number of different filters that they can use. But essentially, so for in this example here, you can see um, their water use and diesel use. These dials are telling them in uh, in relevant to the rest of the people that they're comparing them to. If they're up in that red section there, they're performing that top one there for water at 92%, they're up in the top 8% of water users per hectare. And at the bottom there, uh, this is 
tells them that in terms of their diesel use, they're up in the top 16% of diesel users. So what these benchmarking reports enable them to do is highlight where they've got opportunities for improvement and changes in their practices to improve their performance. But what it also does, it enables them to highlight where they're performing really well. So this dial here in the green box, you can see this is their biodiversity area. So this is an area of land that they've dedicated to enhancing biodiversity. And you can see that they're up in the top 7% of all the members that they're comparing themselves to regarding how much biodiversity the area they've got on their vineyard property. So um, we encourage growers to use this as much as possible to identify areas where they can make improvements, where they can enhance their efficiencies and increase their production. Uh, this is Richard Bateman from Bantry Bay over in Margaret River. Again, they're a certified member. And this is what he says and many others say that the use they use the metrics to find the areas that they can improve their business. And if they can change a variable, they'll change an outcome. This is just a snapshot of the self-assessment workbook that they all go through. This is one area which is really important to us and that is biosecurity. Essentially, they work their way down this list of the different um, questions and each list is consistently right the way through the workbook. At level one, they're demonstrating that they've got some knowledge of the area at level two, they've taken that knowledge and they've put it into action. At level three, this is what we consider best practice. And this is where we're aiming for everybody to get to. And then some people go beyond that and achieve their stretch goal. At level four, this is where they're consistently demonstrating that they've got continuous improvement strategies in place. So all of that information is also benchmarked for them. So they can go back at the end of each year and work out where they're um, performing in each of these areas and how they um, are performing relative to other members. This is Anton Groffron from Wirra Wirra in McLaren Vale, also certified members of the program. And he, like many others say, it's this workbook and that assessment of their practices every year. It helps them to plan the year ahead so they can identify, because it's listed there, what they need to do to improve in each of the areas. And they can put a tick by it and say, okay, this is the area that I'm gonna focus on for the year to improve on. Okay, moving to the certification part of the program. As I said before, um, membership is open to all grape growers and winemakers in Australia. Uh, anyone can become a member and the members, it's just a small commitment. Essentially, they're logging on every year and they're supplying a set of their data, they, all of those business metrics, and they're going through the self-assessment workbook. Those who are more committed to this um, process though, they go on to be independently certified. So that is that they go through an independent audit and it's those ones we call the certified members and those are the ones displaying the trust mark. Now the way certification works, and again, this is a little bit unique to Australia. I don't think any of the other international equivalent programs do this. Um, our industry has two independent standards for sustainable practice. We work really closely with a company called Fresh Care and Fresh Care, their role is that they manage a number of different standards for other industries, but it makes our standards completely independent. We work closely with them in that we tell them what the important things are that we want to measure and monitor with regards to sustainability, and then they put it into the language that can be audited for us. So that's the role of Fresh Care and how we work with them. As I said, they have other standards. They look after food safety standards, environmental standards, and sustainability standards. But the other important thing is that they manage a group of independent certification bodies and it's these certification bodies who do the audits on our standards. So again, it, it, um, what it does is introduce a layer of extra rigour in that these are completely independent from the wine industry itself. These are independent players coming in and doing the audits. So you can see the list of um, certification bodies there. These certification bodies do lots of other audits for other areas. They do uh, audits for organic systems, food safety systems, um, packaging quality systems, lots of other things. So that's what their expertise is. So those two standards there are the two wine industry standards, it's one for wineries and one's for, one for vineyards. If you want to have a look at these, they're freely available online. You can have a look at these and have a look at how um, comprehensive they are. In terms of why people might go on to become certified, 
there's lots of different drivers for different people, but I guess the most common responses we get when we're talking to people out in industry is at a grower and winery level, many people say they find it really helpful to have someone who's independent from their business come in and talk through the operations and practices that they're doing and verify that what they're saying is actually true and that the, I guess the benchmarks that they're trying to meet and the standards of practice that they're employing are actually, you know, as they say they're doing. And I think that leads on to this. Um, I think most Australian wine, grape growers and wineries believe that they're doing things, um, taking care of the environment and being sustainable. But there's many who have said, well, okay, we've been talking this talk for a long time and now I'm going to go this extra mile and I'm committing to walk the talk. Um, for some people, this is about leadership. There's individuals within regions who go down the certification pathway because they want to be seen as a leader. And then even as regions, we have regions emerging where as a region, they also want to be seen as leaders in the sustainability space. And then more and more, we're hearing that um, growers and winemakers, they want to be able to communicate their credentials with more confidence. And going through that third party audit process enables them to do that confidently because they've been through that extra layer of rigor. This is Shelley Ray Brennan. She's from Kingston Estate Wines. She operates across a number of Australian wine regions. So Kingston Estate Wines is a, a large vineyard and winery business. And for them as a business, becoming certified has really two, um, I guess, outcomes for them. It's a formal acknowledgement of their commitment to the program and to be being sustainable. But for them, they really use it as a tool to drive change within their business. So the certified members have all undergone a third party audit. So everything in that standard um, every certified member has been through, they've been able to say and they've been able to verify with evidence that they are meeting all of the elements in the standard. They then go on to use the Sustainable Wine Growing Australia trust mark. So um, more and more we're seeing this trust mark as you've seen in some of these photographs on property signs. So it's really nice growing into a region that has a lot of certified members and you see these signs up on their um, fences. We're seeing them appear in people's email footers. You can see them sometimes on their websites, in other marketing materials. And just now we're starting to see it on more and more wine labels. Um, the, some of the case studies that we do on our growers and winemakers, we usually try to go with the certified members because we know that they've been through that extra layer of rigour. Um, and when we do more marketing activities coming into the future, as things open up after COVID, we expect that it will be the certified members who will be participating in those marketing activities so that as consumers, you can have more confidence that these are the people who have really gone that extra mile and gone through that rigorous process of third party auditing. Um, I thought I'd just show you this collage here of a number of um, our certified members across Australia. As I said, they're growing every day almost, we're hearing or we're seeing certificates come through from more and more growers. Um, and you can see that they are very proud to be, and have, I guess, gone through that extra hoop and become certified. The examples you can see up on the screen here cover a number of regions. There's McLaren Vale, Coonawarra, Padthaway, uh, Adelaide Hills, Margaret River, actually another couple of McLaren Vale ones. So just to give you some example, I guess, an idea of the, the diversity of people who've become certified. I mentioned that the trust mark is starting to appear on wine labels. This is a Glen Goodall from Xanadu in Margaret River in Western Australia. And they just recently launched um, one of their wines that's bearing the trust mark. You can see it very small up in the left here, but over here a little bit larger. So that's it is starting to appear on, on the wine labels and hopefully more and more you'll start to see that in the wine shops. If you do see a trust mark on a wine label, what it means is that the grapes, uh, at least 85% of the grapes that have gone into that wine have has come from certified vineyards and the wine has been made in a certified winery. So just so that you know, it is at those two levels, both at the vineyard and the winery. Um, this is Louisa Rose and Brooke Howe from Yolumba. And Brooke is the vineyard manager at Pusey Vale Vineyard and Louisa is the winemaker. And I thought I'd just spend a few moments talking about them. So these guys have been members of the program for quite a number of years as well. And they became certified uh, about two years ago. 
they've just recently started using the trust mark on their wine labels. So if you've picked up a bottle of Pusey Vale, you've probably noticed the trust mark on the back. Um, I've done quite a bit of work in this Pusey Vale vineyard over the years. Um, but the really interesting part about this particular vineyard is it's located in Eden Valley in South Australia and it's uh, quite a high altitude and it is relatively dry and they're in this vineyard they are heavily reliant on catchment water so they don't have any other water sources it doesn't get brought in from a river there's no nearby river system they don't extract water from underground bores it is all catchment water from dams so in a in a hot year and low rainfall year, they do struggle to get enough water to this vineyard. So uh, that has been their biggest challenge over a number of years. And one of the solutions they've found to that challenge is applying straw mulch under the vines that you can see here in this photograph. Now I became um, aware of this vineyard and I was really interested in, you know, this kind of practice, how much it would cost to do this, what might be the payback. And in terms of sustainability and environmental impacts, could this improve the water storage? Would it reduce the amount of irrigation that they apply potentially? And what might the other impacts of this practice have? So um, straw mulch has a lot of advantages. You can increase the soil moisture because you're preventing the evaporation from, of water from the soil and evapotranspiration. Um, you can increase the potential for soil carbon. It can potentially increase soil nutrients. You can certainly improve weed control because you're keeping the soil dark and so weeds are not able to germinate underneath that straw mulch. And it decreases the need for herbicide use. So you don't need to go through with sprays to control the weeds. And you can also get an enhancement of biodiversity. On the other hand, there are some disadvantages. So you can get an increased risk of frost. If you get a fire, that could be pretty hazardous. Um, it can be a habitat for invertebrate pests, so things like snails and earwigs and other bugs, which we probably prefer not to have in the vineyard. Um, and I know this is a fact, uh, it's a workplace health and safety issue. When I did quite a bit of work out there, crawling between the rows, it can be pretty slippery if you step on some stress, fresh straw. Um, and if you're running tractors up and down, if your narrows are, uh, sorry, if your rows are quite narrow, it can impede some machinery operations. And the other thing is, it is very expensive. Um, the, these guys tried out the straw, straw mulch for a number of years, and essentially they go through a process of renewing that straw every three to four years. Um, what they were, what they, when they did the calculations on this, it was costing them about a thousand dollars per hectare per year to put that straw mulch out there. However, they, there were a lot of cost savings in that they didn't have to go out and use herbicide anymore. They were certainly not doing any undervine cultivation and they were saving water. So they, it did cost them, but the value that they were able to add because they were increasing the yield because they were able to retain a lot more soil moisture was that you know almost $10,000 per hectare per year. So the outcome of that is that the cost of purchase and spread the mulch was significantly less than the additional income received from those fruit sales. For, so for them, it was, a, it was actually a really big win and it continues to be. And as I mentioned, the straw mulch, it did improve the soil moisture. So they were able to save about a half a megalitre of water per hectare. So that's essentially around about 50% of the water they were saving by putting that straw mulch on there. And under a constrained season where rainfall was low, that was having a massive impact on production. And then if you're thinking about greenhouse gas emissions, they were able to mitigate about 100 kilos of CO2 equivalents per hectare. And what that means is essentially in looking at their total emissions, it's equivalent to around about a 10% savings in emissions because they weren't putting the herbicide out, they weren't running the tractor up and down the rows uh, and they weren't pumping as much irrigation. So again, it's another real benefit from putting that straw mulch out. I just wanted to, do, I have mentioned greenhouse gases a couple of times, but I wanted to just go a little bit deeper on this. We talk about greenhouse gas emissions. We talk about carbon dioxide as the primary um, greenhouse gas and its main sources are from deforestation and uh, I guess coal. So when we talk about the green, other greenhouse gases though, we, we bring them back so that they're equivalent to carbon dioxide. The other two primary greenhouse gases we talk about are methane. So in uh, the agricultural context, most of the methane emissions come from stock, so from um, ruminant animals. And methane has 
um, a global warming potential of 25. So in other words, it has 25 times the impact of carbon dioxide. And then the third greenhouse gas we talk about is nitrous oxide. So laughing gas, you might know it as. Nitrous oxide, while its contribution is really low, it actually has a global warming potential of almost 300 times that of carbon dioxide. So that's why it's really important. The reason I'm showing you this is I want to talk to you just for a minute about some of the other work we've been doing in this vineyard and understanding why we bring them all back to carbon equivalents. But that nitrous oxide there, the main contributor to nitrous oxide emissions in vineyards or any agricultural system is the application of nitrogen fertilizer. Now, as an industry, vineyards generally use very low nitrogen fertilizer compared to other agricultural industries. But up until a few years ago, we really didn't know what our emissions were from vineyards. So a project that I was working on a few years ago when I was benchmarking greenhouse gas emissions, we looked at a number of different vineyards across Australia, and this Pusey Vale vineyard was one of them that was our trial site. Um, what we did was we spent two seasons out there in these, these vineyards and going to, in particular to these vines with the straw mulch, those white things you can see out in the vineyard, they're, they're chambers for collecting gas emissions out of the soil. So I had these chambers in the straw mulch, I had chambers in the mid row, and I had chambers in this row here, which you can see doesn't have any straw mulch at all. The other interesting thing about this vineyard is that they are also running an organic system in this vineyard. So it is organic and it's sustainable. So, and next door is a conventionally run vineyard that also has the straw mulch. And I was trying to look at what, um, whether or not there was a difference in emissions across these three different systems here, the straw mulch, without straw mulch, in the mid row, and then in a conventional system. And what I found, which was pretty interesting, on this graph you can see here, this is grams of nitrous oxide per hectare per day. So this was the mid row, and this is the average over a couple of years, about two grams of nitrous oxide emissions per hectare per day. So it is absolutely minuscule. But you can see here, the mid row was actually double the emission that was coming out of the undervine area. And the reason is because the mid row had that constant growth of grass there, which was, well, the, we think the reason was it was um, supplying all the biological activity that was happening in the soil. And it was probably the interaction between the biologicals and the nitrogen that was causing these higher emissions. But really interesting is when we looked at the organic undervine versus the, this is with, without straw compared to the actual straw, again, there was very little difference, certainly not significantly different, but the conventional system was also no different. So that was the one thing we were really looking at. Is there a difference between the organic and the conventional in terms of this specific greenhouse gas emission, nitrous oxide? Um, if you want to know more about um, the Pusey Vale Vineyard and the case study that we have worked on there, that's available on the website. The web address is there. I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that and have a read about what they've been doing because they really have been doing a lot of work on this vineyard, attacking sustainability from many, many different elements. Um, there's also a number of other case studies that you might be interested in reading. Um, there's new ones there. There's not just three. There's a few more if you scroll across. Um, looking at different systems that sustainable vineyards have put in place, I guess, to really protect those sustainability credentials and how they're performing and making sure that they can perform like that for many years to come. Um, I've put this slide in here really as we get this question a lot, you know, what is the difference between organic and sustainable? And I could go into a lot more detail about this. If you are interested in the detail, there is a, um, a full webinar about this on the AWR YouTube channel, but I'm going to keep it really tight and really simplify this. Um, what you can see here is the two intersecting circles of organic and sustainable systems. Okay, what it shows is really that on the right there, oh, sorry, let's talk about the intersecting piece in the middle. The things that they have in common are um, sorry, water, biodiversity, pest and disease management, um, that's pretty much it. And then over on the left, the organics have a focus on GMOs and over on the right, sustainability takes on a whole lot more elements. So it's a much more holistic, it looks at the management systems, it looks at production, it incorporates the community, it incorporates waste and emissions and air management and energy management. So these are the big differences. Now, 
having said that organics has this um, focus on GMs, um, the Australian wine industry as a whole has a position that it doesn't allow any genetically modified organisms um, to be used in the production of wine. So therefore it is inherent in sustainable wine growing Australia. Thinking about um, organics and sustainability in terms of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, just remember I showed you this graph earlier. This is a typical emissions summary from a vineyard. And what you, I guess the key point here is that the two primary emission sources in vineyards are fuel use, so this blue bit, and electricity use. So fuel and electricity in vineyards are used for pumping irrigation, and driving tractors. So they are the two biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions from vineyards. Okay, so they're the two things you've got to think about. So acknowledging that organics is a, um, is a very different system, but it really does not account for any emissions. So if you're thinking about mitigating climate change, organics really doesn't address that. And I think um, one of the other things, again, acknowledging this is a very simplified way of looking at it. In a conventional system, the big, big difference between organics and a conventional system is that organics are not allowed to use synthetic chemicals. That doesn't mean they don't use any chemicals at all. They do, there are some allowable chemicals, but conventional systems have access to a broader range of chemicals, including some synthetics. Now the synthetics are very targeted which means that when you use them, they're more effective. And you, usually if you use them properly, you only have to use them once. Whereas an organic vineyard under the same conditions may use a chemical, but they'll need to use that chemical more times to get the same result as what a conventional system would use with one chemical. What happens, so in a conventional vineyard, for example, if you needed to spray six times in a season, in an equivalent organic vineyard, you may need to use quite a lot more or a, quite a higher number of tractor passes to achieve the same result. So thinking about greenhouse gas emissions, um, this is where organics really doesn't address um, climate change mitigation. It doesn't address greenhouse gas emissions. And in general, for, for two vineyards that were operating in the same region side by side, a conventional one is more likely to have much lower greenhouse gas emissions than an organic vineyard. So I guess I've gone through the Sustainable Wine Growing Australia program in a lot of detail. It's a quite a complex system, um, but you can see it's a very holistic system as well. Um, and what I guess I'd leave you with is if you're looking at wines in a, in a bottle shop, have a good look to see whether or not people are making claims about sustainability. If you're unsure, I mean, look for the trust mark first. You may not find it yet because they're only just starting to find their way onto their shelves. But if you're interested before you go to the bottle shop, what I'd recommend you do is visit our website. Up here on the top right where it says search members, you can go in there and actually search the members of our program and find out who is part of it and who has gone through that process of certification. Um, if you click on that, you'll come to this page here. You can search by region, you can search by name or a number of different other criteria. I've just selected Margaret River here. And this is just a snapshot of a couple of the members in Margaret River. River. But what you can see is they're all listed there. You can see where they're located, whether or not they're certified or they're just a member and how long they've been in the program for. So you can have a good look at who these people are before you go out and even purchase one. The other thing is that the certified members, these are live links. So I'd encourage you to follow the links and actually go to their website and find a little bit more out about those wines and their producers before you purchase. So lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Sustainable Wine Growing Australia has been around for a long time. We've been through this big evolution and there are many, many, many people who've contributed to where we're at today. So I'd strongly encourage you also to have a look at our website and have a look at the information about us and our history. I acknowledge all of the members because without the members of the program, we would be nothing. Our partners in the project, Australian Grape and Wine and Wine Australia, our Sustainability Advisory Committee, the regions themselves give us a lot of support and also my team at the AWRI. So thank you very much. And I'm open to questions if anyone has any. Brilliant, thank you so much, Marty. That was um, an amazing presentation.
Uh, we did have a couple of questions, uh, but you've done such a terrific job of addressing them all uh, in this comprehensive presentation that uh, I think we'll leave it there. But before we say goodbye to our viewers, do you have any final thoughts to share with us um, as a summary of, of your presentation? Oh, look, I think the only I think my last call out there was probably where I'd like to leave it is I think we know that consumers are more and more interested in sustainability credentials. So I would encourage everyone to really have a good think about it before you go to the bottle shop. Do some research before you get there. And I'd encourage you, if you're looking at Australian wine, have a look at the Sustainable Wine Growing website, have a look at what we're doing, and also have a look who the members are. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and I agree uh, strong with Mardi 100%, and I strongly encourage all viewers to visit the two websites Mardi recommended, sustainablewinegrowing.com.au slash resources and www.awri.com.au. They're both great resources of information. Mardi, thank you so much for your time and for hosting this presentation. And thank you to all for joining us. We look forward to featuring our next Sustainability in Wine Country event with Napa Green on Thursday of this week, hosted by Anna Britton. Access to past masterclasses may be found on our YouTube page, Cork and Fork. And as well, you may find them uh, when you visit our store. You just scan the QR code that's available at the checkout, and it'll take you right to our YouTube page where all of these sustainable programs will be available to you for, for viewing at your leisure. Um, thanks again, Madi. We are so appreciative of your time. And uh, thank you to the Wine Australia team for setting this up for us. And we wish you a wonderful uh, day ahead. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye-bye.